And welcome back to the Thomistic Institute podcast. My name is Father Gregory Pine. I am an assistant director of the aforementioned Thomistic Institute and uh, delighted to join you for this most recent installment of Off Campus Conversations. Uh, for this episode, I am joined by Professor of Theology from Ave Maria University, uh, Michael Dauphiné. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, happy to be on the show, Father. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, my joy. Many people will know you or your, or your name from various publications, um, especially like joint ventures. It's like a it's like a who's who of Catholic theology in America. Just to see the various curated volumes published by, you know, COA Press and Sapiencia Press, to which you have contributed, and Father Lamb and Matthew Levering and others besides, uh, which is edifying and encouraging. Uh, but for those who don't know you, would you just say who you are, what you do, where you live, what's good in life? Uh, so I uh, am a, a revert to, uh, to the faith. I uh, came back to uh, my Catholic and Christian faith in college, uh, first in evangelical Protestantism, and then came back to uh, the Catholic uh, Church at the end of my college time. Uh, ended up studying theology, uh, first at uh, Duke Divinity School, of all places, where I'd done an undergraduate major in engineering, uh, and then at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, taught at University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, so I lived in one of the coldest places in the United States, and then eventually went to Ave Maria College in Michigan, and uh, now have been teaching with Ave Maria University in Florida for 30 years, or also 20 years, not 30, 20 years. Uh, and um, and I've, throughout that time, I've been uh, both worked in administration, but also in teaching. Uh, I've been blessed to be able to be involved in uh, the Aquinas Center for Theological Renewal that I co-founded with Ma Matthew Levering uh, back in, I think, in 2004. And uh, we actually held our first conference in 2001 at the, um, the Reading John with St. Thomas, which was a great book as well. And now I've been uh, co-directing that, with, uh, especially with um, Roger Nutt, and uh, also with helping out with uh, Steve Long over the past uh, dec uh, actually dozen years or so. Uh, so I've been able to do a lot of work and both in my own teaching I teach a course on C.S. Lewis uh, that's uh, been very well received by students. Also teach a lot of Aquinas and scripture and uh, just, you know, many beautiful things from the tradition. And then I've also been able to uh, help kind of create spaces where scholars can get together to recover the tradition uh, to kind of uh, a lot of our books have focused on not only Aquinas, but also Aquinas and his biblical commentaries. We've done books on reading Romans, reading John with St. Thomas. Uh, we've also done um, books on Aquinas and the um, crisis in Christology uh, that we've done with uh, Father Andrew Hofer, uh, who is a co-editor, and also with Father Dominic Legg uh, as a you know co-organizer that we've done. And so that's uh, some of my work. I have a book with uh, Matthew Levering on uh, Thomas Aquinas, Knowing the Love of Christ. We have one on the Bible, Holy People, Holy Land. And then we also had a book we recently did with Word on Fire Press uh, with Bishop Barron called uh, Wisdom of the Word, 10 Answer or 10 Biblical Answers or Biblical Answers to 10 Pressing Questions about Catholicism. So and, uh, my most recent uh, fun initiative has been to uh, start the uh, Catholic Theology Show, a podcast. So we launched that a year and a half ago, well, basically on the Feast of John Paul II at the end of two, uh, 2022. Nice. How's, that go How's the experience of that been? Uh, it's, it's been really encouraging. Uh, so we're still, you know, growing listenership, but I think we've had over 30,000 uh, listens, which is uh, really splendid. And... Uh, most of all, what I really enjoy is occasionally running into alumni of the university or parents of Ave Maria University students or, or other people who will say, uh, you know, thank you so much for doing this. I really enjoy it because often people outside of the classroom don't ever get to kind of like poke into the classroom. And so I can sit down with professors here or visiting scholars or, you know, visiting speakers and people who might not be able to make that campus event where, you know, Archbishop Cordelione hey, spoke uh, at Ave Maria at the beginning of the year, but they can sit down and listen. So you kind of get a little bit of a window into the classroom, a little bit of a window into our lectures uh, for people all over the country. Uh, and I think, you know, that's been, it's been a real joy. I've uh, in, enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. It's interesting. It seems like the tendency in podcasts is to greater intimacy at present, because you have a lot of these podcasts which are for everybody and everyone, and it seems like the only goal of them is to be as attractive as possible or to garner as much of a listenership as possible. 
But in the wake of that, people recognize like, I don't want to pertain to an anonymous horde. I want to pertain to a like a little platoon. And so you find the podcasts are being curated now more for a local audience. So it's like, hey, like we want to talk to folks interested in the mission of Ave Maria University or folks interested in the type of theological enterprise that we have going on here. And if other folks listen in, you know, God be praised, cool. We're not going to turn people away so that we can have a, a micro listenership. But it's like in, in focusing more on the local, you have a pro, like a product, to speak somewhat crassly, that has greater application or better application uh, kind of in the global setting. So it's, 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 I don't know, I'm encouraged by that because there's a kind of... Um, yeah, megalopostolate tendency wherein, yeah, you can just kind of end up losing your soul if you don't have a keen sense of the particular people for whom you're teaching and preaching. So, yeah, that's awesome. Um, all right, so we're following up on a lecture that you gave uh, for, as part of a, you know, Thomistic Institute event. Uh, and in that lecture featured the thought of one Clive Staples Lewis quite prominently. And I thought that maybe we could just talk about him and his influence in the, you know, kind of contemporary Christian space, Catholic space, and because there's something about his manner of explaining, of using imagery, of getting to the heart of a Christian doctrine, of subordinating all the complicated prose to the communication of a concept, which just continues to speak to, you know, uh, readers and listeners in 2023. What's your, you know, kind of encounter with C.S. Lewis been? What is it about him that really kind of captured your attention? And how do you find, you know, teaching and kind of like preaching, as it were, some of the insights that he, uh, that he saw uh, has been, you know, in the here and now? Yeah. So when I was, uh, when I came back to the faith in college, I started reading some Lewis. I started um, reading more, you know, re re reading through a fair amount of Lewis, but also through Augustine and Aquinas. And then when I got to graduate school, I mainly left behind Aquinas and studied a lot more Augustine and Aquinas and scripture and, uh, and, and obviously many other, you know, uh, many other theologians. Uh, and then when I went to teach, uh, I remember, I remember teaching, uh, Newman, uh, who I, I adore. I, I love John Henry Newman, now St. Uh, John Henry Newman as a, as a, just a, a, as a thinker, as a writer. Uh, but I remember teaching him to students and just many students that I, uh, <sighs> Ottinger just didn't love him as a writer and, mm -hmm. and as a thinker. They found his Victorian language strange. Uh, and um, and so it, I was kind of like, hmm, what should I do? And actually, it was a conversation with Matthew Levering, who was uh, teaching uh, somewhere else at the time, and he was, he was teaching a course on uh, Lewis and Chesterton. And I thought, you know what? I think, I think that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. I think basically – and then when I went back and I started reading a lot of uh, Lewis – and, and in part, I, I was working with Father Joseph Fessio at one point in the early days of Ave Maria, and he loved uh, Lewis's miracles. Okay. And uh, he, he's been teaching that book uh, since he was stationed in the army in Germany in the 70s, right? So he just loves that book. And I went back and I read it, and I kind of saw, wait a second, this is Aquinas's philosophical theology, in, including not only his philosophical theology, his philosophy of God and creation, but also kind of his philosophy, his theology of redemption. And so I kind of saw in a way that Lewis drew together this great tradition from Dante, from Aquinas, from Augustine, from Athanasius, um, that, but, but, without, but without mentioning them. <laughs> He just was able to kind of re-immerse himself in, the, in that worldview, in that mindset, and then represent it to people in a way that was very accessible. So that, I think, was the first stage in learning to teach Lewis and learning to kind of enjoy Lewis is seeing uh, we have this beautiful tradition, but because of its language at times, its modes of thought at times, the rhetorical modes, right, you know, that are popular in the Summa, the reading articles and questions is hard for students, uh, that, that a, Lewis is able to kind of somehow summarize and make that available to people today. And then the second big insight I had was as I was, you know, I'd been teaching that class for a couple of years, and I'd been reading a lot of biographies uh, about Lewis, and there was a book by Alan Jacobs called The Narnian, and it was basically, you know, um, kind of the imagination of the author of Lewis. And so it kind of retold Lewis's story as what kind of human, be what kind of person could end up writing the Chronicles of Narnia? 
Uh, but anyway, in there, he has a quote from Lewis, and he, it says something like this. For me, reason is the organ of truth, imagination the organ of meaning. And then he said, imagination is not the cause of truth, but its condition. Uh, and in revivifying old metaphors and creating new, right, um, basically gives meaning to truth. So I saw then in Lewis a way of harnessing both the truth, like reason and its ability to attain truth, combined with the way that our, since we're not angels, right? Uh, we're not Cartesians, right? We're not angels. We are actually, we only hold truths that are connected to our imagination, right? Even like when God wants to tell us how much he loves us, right? He becomes a human being. He dies on a cross. So the, I, I attain the truth that God loves me and that God is love through the image of Jesus Christ on the cross, Jesus Christ risen. So I thought that Lewis's way of drawing these together was really powerful. I think it even relates to Aquinas' understanding, right, that the intellectual concept is always associated with a phantasm of the intellect. Uh, but so then I began to then put kind of Lewis's uh, Narnia stories more at the center of my course, and I began pairing uh, a, like a, fiction, a, a fictional Narnia book with a nonfiction apologetic writing and really showing how that in all of Lewis's writings, he's always appealing to both our reason and to our imagination, so that in his apologetic works, he appeals to both. And then also in the fictional works, those are not merely imagination. Those are written from a mind to a mind, from reason to a reason, drawing on imagination, but for the sake of helping us to encounter truth, so that truth would uh, really transport us into this recovered sense of meaning. Um, okay, it's it's fascinating. So you made mention of miracles, which I think of all the signature classics, the ones that are often collected or boxed together, most people find forbidding. Um, so they're more likely to pick up screw tape letters or problem of pain or the great divorce or maybe a grief observed or maybe, you know, whatever else. But but I think a lot of people find miracles most forbidding because it is the most philosophical or because it is the most maybe theological is the appropriate word. For somebody who hasn't read a lot of Lewis, um, where, where would you suggest onboarding? What would you say are the best types of works maybe to read together or maybe to read just kind of in series that give you an insight into his imaginative, rational capacity or just to his genius? Yeah. I, I definitely think that mere Christianity has a power uh, that is ju just unique, um, you know, in the history of 20th century literature, uh, Christian literature that's really amazing. You know, he gave those uh, in... B and, and the in the for the BBC during the war, uh, and um, it was interesting. His BBC building, by the way, was uh, they had to interrupt uh, recording twice because bomb once bombs fell near the building, the other time a bomb hit part of the building, uh, and we don't have those anymore, by the way, because they had to reuse the recordings. Uh, but but I really think mere Christianity uh, is just a unique. Is, is a unique presentation of really the whole vision of the Christian life. I have a friend who was a fallen away Catholic who had a Baptist friend, and he gave him mere Christianity. This was about 15 years ago. And um, he read it and, and then immediately became Catholic. And so even though mere Christianity is not a Catholic book, and Lewis purposely wants to try to be merely Christian in a way that there was not he says it's not like a lowest common denominator. He says it's like the richest form of Christianity that he can imagine, but without getting into the differences between the things, um, between, you know, say Catholicism and other Protestant and, and Protestant denominations. Nonetheless, the vision he presents there is really a deeply Catholic vision, right? Um, he's drawing on the patristic and the medieval world. Even Narnia becomes, it's a medieval Catholic world. Uh, and so in the in there, like at the very end when he talks about um, how do we get in the Christ life? If we need the Christ life, how do we get it? Well, we need it, we get it through faith or belief, through baptism, and through the Eucharist and Holy Communion. So even though, right, he, yes, he's an Anglican, um, right, as an Anglican, he had a rather kind of Catholic sacramental vision of the world. And it's interesting, he even went to a weekly, or he went to regular um, confession, which was allowed in the Anglican Church, but not that many Protestants go to, um, you know, go to confession. 
Uh, so and uh, and also believed in purgatory, these other dimensions. So that's one thing. I, just as a note on on that topic, that I think the theology that he writes is often very compatible with this rich Catholic tradition, and I think is a way of helping people to recover it. The other thing that he does in Mere Christianity, uh, just two other points. One is, you know, he begins Mere Christianity. He doesn't even talk about Jesus until like chapter seven or eight, you know, of, 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 of the book. And he, when he was giving these talks, they were during the war. And during the war, he's supposed to give comfort. He doesn't even mention Jesus until like seven months into his talks, right? Because he gave five first and then five more. But what he really does is he helps. Lewis was convinced that before we can preach the cure to modern uh, human beings, we need to present, we need to first give the diagnosis, right? He gently kind of diagnoses us with, with sin without ever us feeling like we're being ashamed or anything. He just says kind of like, well, there must be a standard of right and wrong because we constantly argue, and we wouldn't argue without appealing to a standard. We can't recognize a line as crooked if we don't know what a straight line is. And right, so he goes through this, and he just keeps mentioning this idea, and he says, so we know two things. One, we know there's a moral law, and secondly, we know we don't keep it. So, and 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 in that way, right, he argues eventually, well, if there's a moral law, then there must be something that causes the moral law that's not us. So he, again, not in a, he says, precisely because we disagree about the moral law, we know there's a moral law, and precisely because we disagree about it, we can't be the source of it, but it must be God. But then he says, this isn't necessarily a good thing for us, because if there is no moral law, then all our sacrifices are in vain. But if there is a moral law and a God behind it, then we're on the wrong side of it. Right? So he gently leads us into a problem into which then Christ can become the solution, right? And then the second thing, I think in some of the second half of, in books three and four of Mere Christianity, he's just able to articulate the moral life in a really theologically rich way that never succumbs to moralism. I think Lewis is kind of a moralist of the greatest kind, a moralist who's never moralistic, right? He tries to create, though, that there is a way of living and experiencing the world that is richer uh, than we normally, um, you know, than, than we normally uh, experience. And, you know, there, uh, T Tom Monahan, who ended up founding uh, Ave Maria uh, University and is its um, chancellor, uh, he actually wrote in an interview that it was reading the chapter on pride from mere Christianity that basically, he said it, you know, hit him like a two by four and he recognized that, yes, he'd always been somewhat devout, but that he was you know, he was prideful, he was acquisitive, he was competitive. And so somehow Lewis's way of articulating these things in mere Christianity really helped him, uh, you know, see that. And I think Lewis somehow has that ability to articulate. So I think mere Christianity is a great place to start. It's interesting, um, it was said of St. Dominic that when he corrected one of the brethren, it was often days before the individual recognized that he had been corrected because he was so gentle. Uh, not that he was weak, right? Or not that he was febrile or in any way, but that he communicated with such a, like a, like a sweetness almost, you know, a sweet strength, but a sweetness um, that, uh, that just commended it to the individual who stood in need of correction. And I think that this point about like non-moralistic moralizing is a fascinating one. It's, I, th I think it's one that the 21st century is very much interested in. I think here of uh, the postmodern author, may he rest in peace, David Foster Wallace, who typically he, com he conveys a kind of moral vision by acute description. Uh, and the acute description reveals certain absurdities which cause you to question and then potentially to change. But it seems like, um, yeah, like what you're describing with C.S. Lewis, it's, it's a similar, he doesn't start with do this or don't do that, but he describes the mystery and then the mystery itself opens unto a potentially transformed life, which you realize has a kind of claim. Um, so maybe, I don't know, could you could you talk a little bit more about C.S. Lewis in the sense of like, should we say, is he a teacher? I mean, is he a preacher? Is he, what is he? Because I know he has a, a university appointment. You were describing he was at Cambridge, he was at Oxford. We have these scholarly texts of his, like the allegory of love and the discarded image and things besides, which a lot of people pick up because they see the name and then set down because it's not what they expected. Um, but what are we to make of like, of him, of his mode of engagement, of his, of his witness? Well, I think maybe... Maybe the best way to approach it is to begin to say some of the things he said. Yeah, I mean, I think this is is helpful. And and in the talk I gave um, to the Thomistic Institute uh, chapter at, at Belmont Abbey, uh, I, I looked at different things about how do we how does Lewis help us recover our faith? Because we have to remember, 
like we've lost something. And I think Lewis had a keen sense that we lived in a post, a post-Christian world is different than a non-Christian world. We've, in a way, we've not only lost Jesus Christ, we've also lost God and we've lost man, right? Uh, so one of the things I, I do is I think Lewis helps us to just understand in a way God and creation, right? That, that there is a God and there is creation and that we're not in competition with God, right? He, in the screw tape letters, he talks about the philosophy of hell is that to be means to be in competition, right? And there he's actually paraphrasing or inversing, averting a line from Dante's uh, par- Paradiso, which is that there to be is to be in love, right? And, and so I think that helps us to kind of say, wait a second, creation is not absurd, God is not absurd. I am not absurd, right? And he does this through kind of um, arguments for God from desire in the weight of glory, which is beautiful, um, that if we have a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, then that's good evidence that there's something beyond this world. Again, our reason, our morality, all these things that are, they're either not reason and not morality because they're merely just uh, evolutionary response to stimuli, or if they are genuinely reason and genuine morality, which everything we experience indicates that they are, then there must be a source of them in God. So he kind of helps us to take what we know and resist these kind of post-Christian reductions of everything to what is lower and say, instead, our whole world reflects something that is higher. Uh, so I think, he, you know, he does that, I think, in, in many ways. And I think in doing so, he helps us not only recover God, but he helps us recover ourselves. Therefore, not only does God exist, but we also are creatures that wonder, that have deep desires that are rich, that are moral and rational, right? Even if we're broken and wounded, right? Um, But but I think that creates a kind of vision of the human person and of God that is hopeful. It's kind of like when you... uh, and Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia will often describe the characters in the story that the more time they've spent in Narnia and they've breathed the Narnian air, they get older, they get more courageous, right? Um, uh, Aslan the lion will even breathe on the characters from time to time. And I think in a way, when you read Lewis's writings and when you read uh, his fiction, you kind of grow in a sense a little bit of, like the world's a little bit more enjoyable, So I definitely think Lewis is, he has a degree in philosophy, he has a degree in uh, English literature. Um, He is a, uh, just like a scholar and a reader of the first rate. Um, One of, you know, which is incredibly learned, um, you know, human being and uh, literature person from so much throughout the patristic and medieval and Renaissance time periods. And, but but he somehow draws all that together in ways that he 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 really though it's like he becomes a poet and, and he wanted to be a poet as a uh, as a young man uh, he wrote a, a a long poem right after uh, World War One uh, at where, where where he you know fought and was injured in World War One he but in doing so I think he he was never able to be the poet that necessarily he wanted to be according to like uh, a more standard form of poetry. But in terms of a poet who was able to use words to create an atmosphere, uh, I think he really is that. And and when, like, you read his apologetics, it's not just the logic. It's the vision that he opens up. It is the logic, but he needs to kind of, like, say, you know, like, well, people don't, um, you know, people think, how can God listen to, you know, a million prayers at once? Well, he says, you have to stop thinking of God trying to listen to a million prayers at once because God embraces all time. God is God has all eternity to listen to everybody's prayers. So you have to kind of get rid of a false image to replace it with a better image, and then all of a sudden the logic works. Um, so I, I do think to kind of think of Lewis in his fiction and in his nonfiction as kind of a, a, a poet who's able to create an atmosphere. Um, I sometimes tell students that like the world of Narnia is, imagine there were a world in which the Bible were true. Right. Imagine a world that which the Bible were true and in which we actually lived in a world created by God and redeemed by God. That would be Narnia. Right? And of course, that is our world. But but the problem is is that we've 
we've we we have a hard time experiencing it as such. And I think that's what Lewis's writings as a kind of poet uh, is able to do. So um, I know that you, you made reference to this back and forth between Lewis and Tolkien regarding the place of allegory um, in literature. Um, and I, I think like Tolkien thought Lewis was somewhat heavy handed in his use of imagery or specifically in his use of, you know, like metaphor and simile and other such devices for uh, illuminating the human condition and conveying something of the gospel itself, um, which he deemed to be inartful. And I think of, you know, criticisms that you'll sometimes hear, um, uh, you know, like uh, Levidon, G.K. Chesterton, that he's an essayist, you know, he's a journalist, and that he occasionally indulges in fiction, but it's just kind of like themes on stilts. His characters don't actually have names and faces. They're just the incarnate version of something he described in better, you know, in, in better words elsewhere. Um, so I wonder with, with Lewis, um, can, you, can you save him from the accusation of the overly didactic? Do you think that, that Narnia stands on its own as children's fiction or that the Space Trilogy stands on its own as science fiction? Or do we read those things because they're part of a, an oeuvre, you know, to which, you know, mere Christianity and the Screwtape Letters pertains as well? Like, what would you, what would you suggest there? So I think that, you know, Lewis would say that Narnias are the, the Narnia stories are not allegories. Um, he would actually call them supposals uh, because he, like Tolkien, both knew that an allegory was a very specific form of writing. And Lewis wrote an allegory, The Pilgrim's Regress, which was the story of his conversion. And there, there's a giant called Despair. And the giant called Despair symbolizes, well, despair. Right? And there's another man that he meets called virtue. And the man he meets called virtue symbolizes virtue. You know, so that's a that's a proper allegory. When Lady Philosophy shows up in um, you know, in uh, Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy, we're not supposed to she's Lady Philosophy. Right. So that's that's allegory in the strict sense. Uh, I think when we step out of that, so what Lewis says is supposing there were a world like Narnia and supposing it like ours needed redemption. And supposing God, as he did in our world, decided to become incarnate in that world, well, that would be Narnia. So it's a supposal. And, and I think in the same way, right, Tolkien's story as well is rich in its, you know, Catholic symbolism, uh, right? The ring is destroyed on March 25th when, um, you know, which is the same day of the Annunciation and the traditional day of the Good Friday. So um, right, you know, the the ring gets carried up the cross. The ring basically is sin. It has power over everyone except Tom Bombadil, who's why is he in the story? Because he's kind of like Adam. You know what I mean? Like, you know, now he's he's diffuse and he's rich in Tolkien. He, Tolkien creates a whole myth. He creates a whole world. And uh, Lewis wrote a wrote an essay where he just said kind of like why fairy story fairy stories sometimes um, you know say are best to say what what needs to be said. And so. Lewis chose kind of the fairy story model as a crisp, short, focused storyline. Uh, and I, I think that the stories hold up, you know, really beautifully. Uh, and they, there is a way that Aslan is the character of Aslan. Aslan, you, when you hear about Aslan, it's not like, oh, that's Jesus. It's like, that's Aslan. Uh, and when you think about Edmund after he's sinned, after he's been redeemed, or after, you know, he just goes on looking at Aslan, right? That's a beautiful image of our redemption and of just, he's looked, but, but Edmund, the character who's a snotty boy who betrayed his siblings, who ended up, you know, realizing it, he can't get himself out of the debt that he owes to the witch. The witch owes, owns him because he's a, he's a traitor. So he's stuck in a position and so, well, Aslan saves him. And so, yes, that's that's like Jesus saving me. Um, but I can still see the characters on their own. And so I think the ability of the characters to stand on their own is what allows uh, this, allows the stories to work. And the other thing I think that's also just really powerful is, it seems to me that, uh, and Lewis talks about this as well, is that um, when we, when we look at our faith and when we look at Christianity, again, how do we recover our faith? Well, 
in part, we have to recognize what's Christianity about. And I think Lewis was always very good. Christianity is not fundamentally about um, Christ, or it's not about Jesus teaching us stuff. We've had lots of good teachers, and we didn't listen to them, as Lewis put, puts it. So why would we, if Jesus is the perfect teacher, we're certainly not going to listen to him. We didn't listen to Aristotle or Plato or Socrates or Buddha or Confucius, right? So, uh, so we need more than a teacher. We need a savior. We need a redeemer. And in the screw tape letters, he says, right, the early Christians were converted by one historical fact, the resurrection, and one historical um, or one theological doctrine, the redemption. So I think, you know, the, we, the, the tendency in the modern period to want to kind of turn Christianity into merely, uh, you know, let's do something that will help society. Let's do something that will help the individual. Uh, I think he really gets at that. And then he also gets at this theme of Christ's redemption and then also providence. And throughout a lot of N the Narnian stories, the interesting thing is that, you know, Aslan doesn't act a lot. He acts occasionally, and then the characters have to do a lot on their own, and yet somehow it all works out. And so I think a lot of his writing is this meditation on the fact that there's one thing that God needs to do for us, which is he needs, or he, this, you know, he, he dies and rises again in Jesus Christ, and he sends the Spirit. And in the stories, you know, Aslan does that, and then Aslan guides the characters from time to time. But then the characters have to often act, and yet God's providence is still accomplished. And I think in many ways, that's what we live in today. We live in that age after Jesus has done everything and sent his spirit, and yet also in an age in which we have to be faithful and trust in God's providence. Um, so I'm thinking, uh, all right, I, you know, in order to inherit the kingdom, you must, we must be like little children. And there's there's something about C.S. Lewis's specifically the Chronicles Chronicles of Narnia, but perhaps uh, it's present in other of his literary works as well. But this kind of like invitation to childhood. So I'm thinking of the inscription of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where he addresses it to whatever it was, his niece, maybe Polly, and he says, "You know, I intended these for you when you were little, and alas, it's taken me forever to write them. But there'll come a time where you're old enough to appreciate them again." And I think that, um, like a lot of Christians read that and they think, yeah, I, I wish I'd encountered this when I was little, but I'm encountering it now. And perhaps it's better that I encounter it now so I can recover what I had when I was little. Uh, because I think a lot of us look back at our childhood and think, not like, you know, how terrible I missed out on great literary works, but we look back at, at like time wasted, perhaps, or opportunities left, I don't know, underdeveloped or whatever else. So uh, do you find that that's present? you know, in Lewis more broadly, this idea of a kind of recovered childhood in the Lord or this idea of a kind of, yeah, recovered innocence even? I think that's a huge uh, theme uh, in Lewis and I think also in, uh, like, the writer, in, in, I think, in the characters he writes and in the effect of reading Lewis, uh, that, you know, Lewis wrote, a, he there's there are a lot of different themes, and uh, Michael Ward has a fascinating book on uh, Lewis that I think is helpful, Planet Narnia. Uh, but one of the things he identifies is that Lewis would also was a loved the planets, and uh, the idea that the planets exercised, even though they were not true as gods and not true as planets, right in the medieval uh, model cosmologically, they were still true as spiritual realities. And he thought in many ways that the 20th century was a Saturnine age. It was under Saturn. Basically, it was about death, despair, right, ugliness, um, cunning, like kind of a, a wisdom that became, uh, but but no longer a joyful wisdom. It was you know it was more like the experienced sinner who knows everything and can't be enchanted by anything. Uh, and yet, ironically, what Lewis thought is that that was, the, in many ways, the 20th century after all the world wars and the, uh, the intellectuals of his day. But what he thought is they were all under an enchantment. They were under this saturnine, this uh, despairing enchantment. And I think we see that today, right? The, um, I don't know, it seems like every time you, uh, you know, hear of something on Netflix, it's another dystopian miniseries. Everybody, there's another Hunger Games or something I think somebody was telling me about, um, or like there's that other thing, I don't know, Squid Games, I don't remember what it is. But it's just like we, we, like, we don't, we're so hopeless. 
But we got to remember, that's actually not reality. That's a, I think Lewis thought that we were under an enchantment. And he says this in The Weight of Glory, where he says, do you think I'm trying to weave a spell? Perhaps I am. But remember your fairy tales, right? Spells are not only good for um, you know, enchanting, but also for breaking enchantments. And he says, you and I have been under uh, one of the, you know, the greatest enchantments, which is the enchantment of worldliness, Namely, and he says, all of the philosophy and education for the last several centuries has been that the good of man is to be found in this earth. And because we've been looking for the good of man in this earth and have not found it, we become like, we don't, we, we lose that sense of that joyful hope that there is meaning and wonder. Uh, but we're kind of like, you know, the disillusioned, um, you know, the disillusioned uh, sinner who mocks any joy and of 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 an, an innocence, and so I think Lewis writes a lot purposefully, and and even uh, say the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which is the first story where it's it's very jovial. Uh, it's kind of under the spiritual reality of 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 Jupiter in a way, but not Jupiter the God or Jupiter the planet, but just Jupiter the spiritual reality, which is authentic kingliness, which Lewis describes in The Discarded Image. But one of the things he describes there is that, well, what would it mean to have a king at peace, jovial? So even though bad things are constantly happening in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, there's always a sense like, but it always works out very quickly, right? Um, and some awful things happen, right? There's a battle between Peter and the wolf that's really described kind of rather shockingly for little children. And then Aslan, well, gets stripped and mocked and uh, dies, uh, and yet the witch says, right, and in that, you know, uh, despair and die. And yet it turns out, of course, she's the fool in the story. Uh, and so I think Lewis is wanting us to recover that kind of joyful, jovial mood uh, that, that God has a plan um, and that God does not lose battles, right? In this world, we will lose battles, and history may be a long defeat, as, um, as uh, Tolkien said. Right, a long defeat um, with glimpses of final victory more often in fiction. Right, um, so you know th there is that element, but but I think we should recover a sense of that uh, joyfulness of children because we got to remember it's only when we think that the good of man is to be found in this earth that's when we become despairing. When we remember that, wait a second, no, I'm made for something more. Right, there's a reason why nothing earthly satisfies my heart because I wasn't made for this earth, right? Um, and, you know, Lewis says memorably in Mere Christianity where he says the whole history of sin, of, of um, you know, of, of division, of wars, of uh, poverty, is the hist all of that is the history of trying to find something other than God to make us happy. Uh, so I think when we remember that, I think we can recover a kind of innocence and a kind of joy in, in, in living um, that, that in many ways, I just, the last point on that is really, I think, is what Lewis wants us to see in uh, the whole theme of courage, that yes, there is suffering, that yes, there is brokenness, but we can have courage and hope. Um, and Lewis has one line in the Screwtape Letters in Letter 29 on courage and cowardice, but he says, he says beautifully, he says, it's actually, it was many, he says, thousands of men in World War uh, I discovered their cowardice -ness. and upon admitting their genuine cowardice began to recognize the moral order for the first time, right? So it, ironically, it's when we admit that I don't have courage is when I can begin to recover courage, you know, in the Lord. Yeah, it's like, and you're saying that, um, I think of this line from Chesterton in Orthodox in the Ethics of Elfland, like the doctrine of conditional joy. Um, it's like you can you can live in a palace of gold and sapphire if you don't say the word cow, or you may live happily with the king's daughter if you don't show her an onion. It's like it sounds silly to us or farcical or even nonsensical, but at the end of the day, like love is only ever expressed in obedience. Um, but in order to enter into a relationship of loving obedience, you need to acknowledge your own incompetence, at least in some way, shape, or form, because otherwise there's no there's no occasion for dependency, there's no occasion for relationship. Um, and sometimes we come to that by way of the recognition of our own cowardice or limitations or weakness or woundedness or whatever else it is, but there's no other way through, you know, it's just 
It's just that. <laughs> so, um, all right. Well, any final thoughts or any commendations with which to leave our listener apropos of C.S. Lewis? Uh, yeah, maybe uh, two themes. Uh, one is, you know, it's interesting that Tolkien was a was a was a Catholic, and uh, and Lewis was a you know was was a Protestant was an atheist at the time they became friends. So it was interesting, um, right? He was told never to trust two people, either a Catholic or a philologist, and uh, Lewis <laughs> and Tolkien was both, as he puts it. But it was at some point through their friendship, they were actually up until as Oxford dons, they were up until three a.m. one night uh, with a friend Dyson. And it was that conversation, right, in 1931 that really moved Lewis from being not a Christian to being a Christian, that um, that what Lewis loved in the myths that were untrue was actually true in Christianity, because there, what God actually does in time, uh, what the myths do at the edge of time and in poetry, uh, so that in a way the incarnation is God's true myth, because it actually happened. Uh, and that allowed, and we can think about that not as a myth and something that's false, but a myth that's something, it's a story, what God actually does something and changes the world and changes me. Uh, so I think within that idea, it's just that sense. One is the power of friendship, right? The power of friendship before Lewis's conversion and then after his conversion. Like one of the reasons he converted is because he was friends with the right people. And Lewis had in his time a great gift of friendship. He wrote letters back and forth. Uh, to countless people, many Americans, uh, by the way. Uh, some of them ended up studying with him. Uh, and so I think that one, that sense of just Lewis as a kind of, uh, as, as a guide for friendship, uh, and that Lewis helps us to move out of our isolation and into connection. Uh, so I think that's one. And then secondly, within that is the idea that, right, we have to remember that, you know, ultimately, right, the the friend we need is 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 Jesus Christ, right? The friend we need is is God incarnate, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, uh, and that when we realize that that is a gift, that is Lewis has a line where he says, uh, you know, faith. This is a mere Christianity, but he says faith fundamentally admits the bankruptcy of our own efforts. Right, and just that idea that you know God loves us because He is love, and God loves us because He created us and He redeemed us, right? And and I can right receive that through faith and baptism and through communion. So again, recovering friendships with one another, and and making life a little bit more joyful, a little bit more full of wonder. Um, reading these sorts of different elements, and then secondly, that sense of really developing that. Uh, becoming friends uh, with God and recognizing, right, that that friendship is a sheer gift and uh, one which we can really be filled with gratitude for having received. Amen. Alleluia. <laughs> All right, well, thanks so much for taking the time uh, for, for chatting and for the contribution to the Tomiskin Institute podcast. So thanks so much. Excellent. Thank you. And um, maybe just one last thing. Uh, yep. The Avimer University started a Pursuit of Wisdom short courses and on there, I have a six part, 30, like six 30 minute uh, videos on C.S. Lewis. It's called The Wisdom of C.S. Lewis as part of the, wis uh, the Pursuit of Wisdom course. So you can find that at avemaria.edu or the pursuit of wisdom.org. That's awesome. Yeah. And again, one more time, the name of the podcast that you started about a year and a half ago is. Thanks so much. Uh, the Catholic Theology Show. And uh, hopefully in a, um, out of probably a few weeks or so, uh, you'll uh, be able to hear a wonderful episode with uh, Father Gregory Pine on uh, St. Thomas and prayer. There you go. Instead of being richly textually based like this conversation, it just flies in every possible direction based on whimsy and caprice, as is my wont. Um, so, all right. Thanks again. Turning to you, the listener. Uh, thanks so much for tuning into this episode of the Thomistic Institute podcast. If you haven't yet, uh, do subscribe to it on your podcast app or on YouTube, and we'll look forward to chatting with you in future episodes. All right. Know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us, and we'll catch you next time on the Thomistic Institute podcast. 